for about 10 years now, uh, doing some professional services with Splunk. Um, I've had a number of different backgrounds, and we'll, um, yeah, that's enough about me. So, uh, just real briefly, I think a lot of people who are interested in this talk are probably already familiar with Git, but uh, just as a real quick uh, rundown, um, it's, it's an open source tool that lets you track changes to um, files over time. Um, and um, when you first get to use it, uh, there's, some of the stuff can be quite easy, but as you start digging in deeper, there's definitely some, some pitfalls and some things that you can fall into that just kind of make things tricky. So the question then becomes, is like, well, why, why would we try to use Splunk with, with Git? What's, what's the connection? Um, the first thing just to point out is that because of all the Splunk configuration files being text files, uh, it becomes a pretty natural fit to use a tool like Git, which uh, primarily is just tracking changes to text files. Um, uh, basically, a lot of people would be using it for uh, so things like audit trails or trying to recover from a mistake that was made by an administrator, or maybe it was malicious, maybe it was accidental. Uh, either way, it gives you a nice way to kind of roll back, and it gives you a sane, um, sane and safe uh, point of recovery, typically. Um, oops, sorry. So, um, one of the things I always want to make clear right here is that we're not, my, I'm not trying to really replace anything that Splunk already does out of the box. So for example, uh, deployment server, um, the way that the cluster masters are sending data to the, or configurations to the indexers, the way that deployers sending things to the search head, uh, search head cluster. Um, we want to keep using those mechanisms as much as possible. Um, essentially, Splunk's doing a, a good job with those already, so there's no need to replace those. Um, but what you will find is that um, there's cases where you have the same app that needs to be on multiple locations. So for example, let's take like the Windows TA or the, the Nix TA, right? So that has to go to my, my search head because I have to be able to see those things from the front end. I have to have the SIM components, for example, frequently. Um, it has to be on the indexer so that the data is being parsed correctly so it can come, come in. Um, and also it has to go to my universal forwarder. So just like that one example, you can see clearly we, we have that one app going all those different places. Um, so, because, uh, hey, let's use Git. Git's, it's going to be great, right? So what often happens is you do things like this. You go, oh, you know what? Let's just take, grab the apps folder. Let's just pull the whole thing into a Git repository. Um, and the question then becomes, is like, okay, is it, is it, really, is it really that simple? Um, and the answer is well, probably not. Uh, for example, if we're only grabbing the apps folder, well, what about, what about deployment apps? Uh, we're, not, we're not necessarily going to be capturing that, or master apps, or so on and so forth. Um, and then the other question is, is like, do we really want to grab everything in the apps folder? Like, if we grab all of that, now it's specific to the Splunk version that we actually deployed to. So if I go from Splunk 651 to 653, all of a sudden I get a bunch of deltas. Do I really want to see that or not? Um, other things... Yeah, another thing is that just because of the way that uh, Splunk makes changes to your comp file, uh, the changes actually get written back to the local folder, um, which is fine, except that when a stanza gets updated, that stanza actually drops to the bottom of the file and the new content is inserted. So, in other words, you get a bunch of arbitrary changes in your, your diff. As soon as you type in git diff, uh, they have absolutely nothing to do with the actual um, changes that you, you're looking for. So. The question then becomes is why, why is this so difficult? Because it seems like going like, hey, let's just track the changes to my environment. It shouldn't quite be so complicated. Um, and I think the answer to that comes in, in when you start recognizing the degree and uh, number of sources that, of change that are, that are occurring in the environment. So um, obviously new releases on Splunk Base. Um, we've got people making changes, either users adding content, or we've got um, administrators making fixes or, or so on and so forth. Um, we've got stuff like uh, scheduled searches, like if anyone's running enterprise security, you're familiar with generating searches. So you've got, or, and tracking searches. And these guys are running in the background all the time, constantly making changes. Um, and so if you're version controlling that, that's, that's something to be aware of. Those changes are just gonna, gonna take place and, and occur and you have to deal with them somehow. Maybe you wanna keep them, maybe you don't, but it's something you have to think through. 
Um, another thing, and we kind of hinted at this earlier, is that uh, sometimes the, the same app is different places. So again, like the Windows TA kind of idea where um, it could be different places. And sometimes in those situations, I'll actually configure that same app different ways for different locations. So for example, I might only enable the inputs on the version or the, the folder structure inside deployment apps so that my universal forwarders are sending in inputs and I'm not collecting them on my search head, for example. Um, so again, there's just a bunch of different things happening at once and that, that creates a lot of different overhead. Um, if you're looking for the solution to this problem, there's a lot of questions that come into that. Um, we've got things, uh, some of the, the things that can like, you, I mean you guys can read, but um, some of the ones that are really kind of hard to track and really track down are things like, um, hey, I, I've got an air gap environment and I actually have multiple Splunk environments and I want to try to manage them in a similar way because really 99% of the content's the same, but I want to somehow be able to manage that in a central way. That, that becomes really complicated. Um, and then we have questions like we kind of hinted at earlier, where it's like, do I really want to have all my apps in, in Git or not? Um, it becomes kind of an important question. Ultimately, it gets really complicated really fast. Um, so we can't handle all of those types of scenarios in one talk. So we're basically just uh, going to try to, to basically talk about what are some uh, tips and tricks, some best practices to try to keep it simple and start simple. Um, and I'm certainly not proposing a one-size-fits-all. So one of the things that I, I want to point out is that it often, what, what I hear from advice, um, when you read online, you go, hey, let me like, look up, up some best practices for Git. What you typically get is, is developer-centric stuff. So you'll get, you'll get great and giant, I, I forget which project I grabbed this from off Google Images, but this is the kind of stuff that you come up with, right? Like you have a really complex branching scheme. Um, and I guess in some ways, this probably isn't considered complex by, by developer standards. But when you start talking about what you're doing with Git um, within, within the concept of, con, or con, text, excuse me, of Splunk, it often, it's just too much. You typically don't need to go to this level of sophistication. Um, if, you, if you do, you do, that's fine. But the idea is that try to keep it as simple as you possibly can when you're starting with Splunk. Um, often, failing forward is, is the easiest approach. Um, if we're actually treating Git as like more of a file system, version controlled file system, instead of treating it as a developer tool, that can save you a lot of headache. You can still get a lot of your audit trail, a lot of your tracking, a lot of that kind of stuff, but you don't necessarily have to um, worry about semantic versioning or am I making atomic commits. Those types of things are great concepts. If you're developing a Splunk app, absolutely use them. If you're trying to simply manage a Splunk deployment, this kind of stuff is going to drag you into the weeds and it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, my suggestion instead is to keep it simple. Um, really practical stuff, stuff like sync often. Again, anybody that's used Git for any period of time will recognize that that's a very helpful thing to do. Um, wherever possible, avoid branching unless you really need to. Um, sometimes it is necessary to, to pull in a temporary branch for uh, extended change uh, for, a, for a dev cycle or say you're going to release a bunch of new apps. At which point that's, that's very helpful. Uh, but otherwise, if you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, other things just to kind of remember, um, things like author, commit messages, those types of things are, are really great. Uh, the big thing though is, is make sure that you've got a good basis of uh, understanding of how Git works, but don't necessarily get stuck in, in all the, the details of it. Um, and wherever, wherever necessary, just pull in a friend that knows Git well. Um, just don't let them talk you into a really complex branching structure because that will drive you nuts. Um, so earlier we had a list of like a bunch of different questions of how, how do you organize this? If you're getting started, especially if you're getting started, uh, to, to get, get the proper answer for a specific scenario requires a lot more information, a lot more discussion. But a simple way to get started is to kind of follow these guidelines. Uh, instead of putting all the apps in different repos, put the app in, apps in one repo. It just makes it a lot simpler. Um, you can store both local and default. We're going to actually come back to this point here in a lot more detail. Um, basically store the apps together. So in other words, instead of having three different versions of the Windows TA, try to consolidate that down to one version. 
And that way you're not trying to manage, well, this is the version that goes on the forwarder, and this is the version that goes on my, or on my uh, indexers. And this is, because that, that just becomes really complicated. Sometimes you have to do that, but if you don't, try to keep it simple. Um, often you can have extra configuration files in Splunk that it will flat out ignore if it doesn't need them. Like it, the stanza will just not do anything. Uh, just take advantage of that. Um, yeah, use tools to make it easy. So the rest of this talk is actually, is actually focused, focused on that. Um, so I've written a tool that uh, we use uh, in, in, the consulting, in our consulting business uh, to try to avoid resolving the same problem over and over again. Because what we found is that there's a lot of things when you're using Git that just kind of become a nuisance and you keep doing the same things over and over again. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that here on the next slide. But uh, essentially, it's a command line tool. It's very similar in design to kind of the way, the, the way the Splunk tool works, where you've got one command followed by subcommand followed by more commands kind of thing. Um, you know, there's built-in help, uh, so you can pretty much get uh, interactive help for wherever you are. Um, it is a Python package. It's, it works in both 2.7, uh, which is what Splunk ships with, and 3.4 and later. So that's, that's a majority of, of the Splunk, or sorry, the Python packages that are out there. Um, it can also be in stand, a, a standalone executable mode and, and embedded within Splunk. So essentially, that means that I can, uh, we, we've run into this enough times that we kind of made it a feature where uh, it becomes difficult to install Python, uh, Python interpreter or whatever. So you can just kind of leverage the one Splunk already ships. Splunk's already going to be installed. It helps, helps a lot. Not the easiest way to install it, but it's, it's definitely a, a good option. So, um, you like that? <laughs> Um, so sometimes it's actually difficult to tell the diff. Like so, you, you look at that and go, "Well, we're talking about Git, right?" So you can just use the Git diff command. Um, the, the challenge with that is that you're you're actually comparing the text version of the file. You're not comparing the content of the file. So this tool essentially looks at the content as opposed to the actual representation. Uh, so that helps if you have a sort order difference, or if somebody puts spaces between index equals main and somebody else doesn't, that type of stuff doesn't show up. Um, and it also handles multi-line diffs. So if you've got like a big long search, it will still handle that correctly and show you where the, where the changes are. Um, we also have a basic uh, check tool that, that does validation, um, which is pretty straightforward. The only thing I'll really point about, out about this one is that you can use it as a, as a pre-commit hook. Um, there's actually some slides at the end, we'll put, them, we'll put a link to them that have uh, some more information about how to use that as an actual tangible example. But um, the thing that's helpful there is just to know that you can double check your config files before you, like when you type in git commit, it's gonna go check all the config files that you changed and double check to make sure you haven't made a mistake. Uh, and because it tends to be slightly pickier than Splunk's parser, I found that it's actually caught a bunch of mistakes that I've made. So I, I find that to be quite helpful. <laughs> Um, the other thing is a sort. Again, this is uh, pr pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, also available as a pre-commit hook. So if you really wanted to sort your configuration files so that they have a, a standard or like canonical format um, whenever they're saved to your repository, that can be very helpful. Um, another option that we have is we can basically merge. So there's times where, uh, let's say you want to maybe say preview uh, your default local file. You can kind of pull two files together. Um, it's kind of like the, the btool list command, uh, but it's much more scriptable. The btool command output's not necessarily super friendly if you were trying to use it in a script. So, um, the promote tool is, um, is pretty helpful. This is where we start to get some things that really start bringing a lot of value. So, a typical scenario would be this. I'm editing some making some changes in the user interface and making a change to a, like a safe search, right? And I already have that safe search. The base version of it's already in Git. And I'll go along and make a change. That change gets saved in local, right? So local is now gonna contain a subset of the stanza that lists in default. So anything in local will be the things that are different from what's in the default. Um, so the challenge then becomes, is like, well, how do I do that easily in a version control scenario? Um, you can open up an editor, pull them both up at the same time, and then manually move the stanzas over, right? Which is essentially what this tool is gonna to do for you, uh, except that you can tell it to do it um, in, a, in an automated way. You can tell it, like, I wanna move everything over, or you can say, hey, I want you to prompt me and say, hey, you tell me what stanzas I've added. Okay, yeah, I want these two to go and these two to stay. Because what will happen is, 
I might have made a change to one uh, save search, for example, and that one might be ready to push. And I might have three other ones that I made a change to that I'm not ready to push yet. So I don't want to necessarily just blindly merge it all together. I want to do that in an intelligent way. Um, that's what this tool does. So this is where the combined command is where this tool starts to get, um, I think, really, really helpful. And I think this is a really great feature. The primary challenge that we have with Splunk and its default and local architecture is that you have two, literally two, locations that you can put a configuration change. And as we saw earlier, we've got stuff weaving all over the place. We've got changes coming from Splunk base. We've got changes coming from our administrator. Maybe the administrator wants a certain set of changes to go across all the Splunk deployments in an environment, but one over here only gets a subset of that. So how do I manage that in an intelligent way? Or even just to keep it as simple as possible, let's say I've got, um, I, I'm making changes to my local server. Those live in local, right? So I don't want to put stuff in local if I can, if, you know, in version control, if I can, if I can, um, if I can avoid that. Um, but I still want to somehow track what came from the upstream uh, Splunk app or whoever created the, the app upstream, and I want to change my, my layer on top of that. So essentially what this does is if you guys are familiar with uh, a Unix, like a etsy.d type folder structure, uh, like sudoers.d, stuff like that, it lets you create a very similar structure to that um, inside of Splunk. So I could make, like for example, default.d, and I could create an arbitrary number of layers in there, and I could say, hey, I'm going to designate um, all of the stuff that came upstream. I'm going to designate that to one folder. And I'm going to actually name and layer the rest of my configurations uh, beyond that. And I'm going to run this tool to actually consolidate all those layers into one when I'm ready for it. So essentially, visually, it kind of looks like this, right? So we're taking the layers, we're, we're, we're squashing them down, um, and we're getting a new output. So uh, hopefully, hopefully this is visible to everyone. Uh, but so essentially we got our base layer over here is looking like blue, right? So that would be, an example would be, that's like my upstream. So for example, this is like, I just grabbed Cisco Security Suite as an illustration. So Cisco Security Suite, this is a sub, I couldn't fit it all on the screen. So this is a subset of the types of things that live inside of the Cisco Security uh, app. So my organization has some custom safe searches. So that's, that's, that represents my next layer. Another layer down, I've got changes from my Splunk administrator, and they're making changes to indexes and macros. Because they're probably just making a new index and going, hey, I'd rather put my stuff in this custom index as opposed to some other index, right? Um, and I've also got a group of firewall admins that come along and say, hey, you know what? I got some views that I really want to do. So we can see, okay, uh, attacks, knock, big screen. Oh, that's a new custom view. Like, that doesn't exist anywhere else. That's only in this one layer. Um, stuff like device health, again, it's, it's custom. User tracking, oh, I can see I'm actually overriding what came from the user tracking um, layer above. So I'm actually over, overlaying that. Um, and it's smart enough, so in the case of the comp files, for example, those are gonna get merged together, and it's gonna basically take and merge them together, the same way Splunk would do with like a local default type scenario. With XML files, there's no way to actually merge those, so it's basically gonna be the latest one wins, right? So, so highest priority. So if my firewall admin, for example, user tracking is going to be entirely from, from this layer, and this layer will be completely ignored, which is exactly the same way as Splunk does it with default and local. So try to kind of maintains that same uh, paradigm. So really, this is where um, a lot of the value of the tool comes in. There's a lot of cool things you can do with this. Um, it works both in ad hoc use cases as well as long-term use cases. So if you're um, trying to continually remerge files over time, that's uh, not going to be a problem. The app handles that very well. Um, I've also used it for ad hoc stuff like we've, you migrate uh, two servers and you've got that users folder and you go, oh, somebody made changes to the users folder. Like both servers were live at the same time for a little bit while. And people are like, oh, I want to keep my stuff from both servers. It's kind of a hard problem to solve manually. Uh, this tool can be, this exact same pattern can be applied to that, um, and that's it's worked pretty well. Uh, last command we'll talk about is the unarchive ar command. And I say that for last because uh, one of the things that this thing, this tool will do, is, in some ways, it's not that different from like a tar unzip, uh, but it also adds some additional, uh, some Git messages and that, those types of things for you. Like it will take a checks or a hash of the file, report the hash of the file in the, in the message. Uh, the git commit message will tell you, hey, you just upgraded from uh, version 1.1.3 to 1.1.5. It will capture that information for you. 
Um, and the best thing here is that if you're using the layered approach that we just talked about in the last slide, you can actually redirect that default folder to another location. So I can say, hey, instead of extracting default to its normal location, actually go ahead and write it out to my new layer, uh, which saves me some time. Sorry, I have one more command. Well, actually, we're just going to skip that. Um, so, coming back to just looking at some practical tips for Git. So, I definitely recommend checking out uh, the tool that I wrote. I think it's it's helpful. Um, definitely open to any kind of suggestions. But also wanted to kind of keep this a bit uh, general as well. So, um, last thing I'll, I'll just note is just some really practical things that I've run across that have saved me on a number of occasions. Um, and this stuff really isn't super complicated, but it can be helpful. Um, things like when you're doing a pool, make sure that you're not merging if you didn't mean to. Um, that's very straightforward. Uh, typically, if I know that I made a change and I didn't actually um, deploy, push it anywhere else, or it's not rep those versions aren't replicated anywhere else, a rebase can be very helpful to uh, kind of make those changes. Uh, as far as advanced Git usage, I, those things are helpful, and I try not to go too much beyond that on a general basis. Um, the other thing I'll just point out, some people don't know this, I was surprised when I found it, is that if you're running the git command, uh, git commit command, you can say author and you can just give it a short name and it will go back and it will like look at your existing commit logs and it will go, oh, hey, where's Joe? Oh, there's only one Joe in the organization? It will fill out the rest of the information for you. Um, this is really helpful if you're on a shared server deployment type scenario. If everyone has their own deployment, if everyone's working in their own development environment, this type of stuff's not important. But what I find is that often, uh, especially uh, in the consulting world, um, we're working on a shared server, and so we might have two or three people working on the project at a time. It's helpful for us to keep track of who did what. Uh, certainly very helpful. So uh, definitely check us out on, on GitHub. Um, we got some great links to documentation. Um, pretty much you can install it with just a pip command, and uh, certainly are very interested in uh, any feedback anyone has and trying to make this tool more useful and um, helpful to the community at, at large. So, uh, any any questions from anybody? Or what are we, how are we on? You're good. Oh, ooh, look at that, five minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can repeat them and everyone's quiet. Well, I could, I could, I'll just stand real close. Signing off, we're good. No questions. No questions online. <laughs> no questions online. So, all right. Thanks, everybody.